this far right individual um, was very immersed in uh, social media uh, and particularly the website Gab that had been a site of conspiracy theories and holding a lot of anti-Semitic views. So this issue is very timely. Uh, our institute, the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Race Studies, comes out of the lessons of the Holocaust, which is the expression of the worst things that anti-Semitism can lead to. Uh, so we're very pleased today to have our partner Sija uh, with us. Um, it's a timely issue. So I'm briefly, what we're gonna do, we're gonna have our invited speakers are each gonna make a, a small presentation of between eight to 10, 12 minutes, and then we'll go into a group discussion. Um, the event is being uh, broadcast live on Facebook, so if anyone wants a copy of the video after, you can write to us and share it with you. But I'll start off with our, with our featured speaker. So in the middle, uh, we have Steve McDonald. Um, Steve serves as a spokesman for the Jewish community in the national media and prepares written advocacy materials and communication products and plays a, uh, plays a key role in CJA's uh, policy development. He had a long time of serving uh, a member of parliament and was named, I believe, one of the top, um, um, sorry, not, not advocates, but when you were one of the youngest members of parliament at the Hill Times, this is Canada's top 100 lobbyist. So you know how to get the message out and, and get them. I know they're doing amazing work in parliament now to get uh, the Canadian just community to do more on this issue. Uh, next, we have uh, James Rubick, um, who's on the, on the left. He's a data journalist and public relations professional and he made a leap into the predictive digital analysis using online media conversations during the 19, 2016 election. 1916, no, that wouldn't have, we didn't have a social media event, I, I already made a mistake. And he works for Cision, uh, a company that uses big data media monitoring tool to identify how bots were influencing election conversations. So very fascinating, we're gonna hear from him, perspective of technology uh, and big data analytics, which, which you need to know now to understand what's happening on the online ecosystem. And last but not least, we have Alyssa Blank, Alyssa, used to be a youth fellow with me to help us out in past work, so we're very pleased to have her here. Alyssa is a political researcher at CJA. Um, before becoming a CJA, uh, Alyssa served as a government relations coordinator and researcher at the National Office of the Canadian Federation of Students. She's done some really interesting work. She's a graduate at the University of Ottawa and did a specialization on psychological operations of war uh, and could be looking at Palestinian media um, disseminated by Hamas Fatah. So very fascinating. We have three different perspectives here. Uh, so please, everyone, give them a hand and welcome them to you. Hello, are you, Steve? Great. Thank you so much, Kyle, and to uh, to Migs uh, for hosting us uh, for this wonderful partnership, which I think everyone recognizes has become all the more important in recent weeks. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll set the table for the conversation over the next few minutes uh, by providing uh, perspective on on where the issue of online hate fits in with the broader phenomenon of rising anti-Semitism in much of the world. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll turn it over to my colleagues, uh, James first, or Elisa first, Elisa first and then James, uh, to, to provide additional detail uh, on, particularly on the technology side. Um, but I wanna preface this by saying the, the, the research that Migs has done and the work that we do on behalf of the Jewish community and that others do in the field of anti-Semitism is, if anything, uh, uh, a means of understanding the phenomenon of hate more broadly. And therefore, while we're talking about anti-Semitism today, I think it's important to recognize that this isn't simply about the Jewish community. In many ways, Jews are the canary in the mine, in the mine shaft uh, for society. And so if we want to understand how to confront other forms of hatred, uh, understanding the, the, the genesis and the evolution of anti-Semitism, how it's impacted by political developments, and how it manifests itself online and how it can be countered online is, I think, helpful, not just for our community, but for the broader, the broader uh, 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 Canadian society and, and, frankly, the international community. Uh, everyone here is aware that a few weeks ago, a, a self-professed white nationalist who published a manifesto online uh, uh, and live streamed uh, his actions uh, murdered uh, 50 Muslims praying in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, this person was deeply embedded in uh, online hate, in online forums where uh, hateful conspiracy theories about Muslims and immigrants uh, and others are, uh, are incubated. And this was just the latest example of uh, another, uh, of a broader disturbing phenomenon that, that uh, also reared its head in Pittsburgh. In October, 11 Jews were murdered at the Tree of Life Synagogue by a gunman who shouted, all Jews must die, and who in the previous nine months, uh, as Kyle mentioned on, on, the, on the platform Gab, uh, he had posted more than 700 anti-Semitic messages in that time period. 
Um, these are people who, who should have been on the radar, um, and unfortunately, they were able to commit the, the horrific acts that they committed. Um, the, <clears throat> the phenomenon of online hate converting into offline violence can't be divorced from broader developments in the West today. Um, when you look at the global rise of anti-Semitism, and it's particularly pernicious in Western Europe, uh, where Jewish communities, by any measure, are far less safe than they are in North America. So to give you some context, a Jew in France today is 13 times more likely to be the victim of a physical assault motivated by anti-Semitism than a Jew in Canada. A Jew in Sweden is 20 times more likely to be the victim of an anti-Semitic hate crime than a Jew in Canada. And when you think of countries like Sweden and France, countries that in many ways resemble Canada in terms of democratic liberal values and institutions, we realize that we're not immune from this phenomenon in Canada. And when we look at the fact that much of this takes place online, we have to ask ourselves, what's happening offline that's fomenting this? And there are two things that I think are worth, are worth taking a look at. In 1905 and 1906, there were more than 700 pogroms in the Russian Pale of Settlement, pogroms meaning attacks against local Jewish communities. Uh, more than 3,000 Jews were murdered in those years. It is no coincidence that 1905 was also the year in which there was a pseudo-failed revolution against the Russian Tsar. Whenever you see immense uh, polarization, distrust of mainstream authorities, and stretching of the political spectrum in any society, anti-Semitism can thrive. Uh, and the reason why anti-Semitism thrives, regardless of the status of Jews, you know, the same continent in which you had Jews that were highly uh, engaged in society and integrated in Germany, and in which in Poland you had Jews effectively living in shtetls. The same genocide took place in both of those countries with the support of, of often with local populations supporting uh, what the Nazis were doing. Uh, the reason why anti-Semitism thrives, regardless of the conditions of Jews in any given country, is because it's so often motivated by uh, conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories historically have always been the root of anti-Semitism and what makes it particularly pernicious and difficult to, to tackle and, and to dispel. Uh, and this is certainly the case with online hate. Um, my colleague David Ouellette, who's in the room here, has done a lot of work with the Center for the Prevention of Radicalization in, in Montreal. And one of the things that he shared with me is that as they work with individuals that they're de-radicalizing, it is particularly challenging to unpack anti-Semitic conspiracy theories because it is so compelling, especially for young people today, to go online and to go down the rabbit's hole of YouTube and elsewhere and to get captivated by these conspiracy theories. And in the case of the Pittsburgh shooter, it is telling that in the hours before he committed the attack, he posted online claiming that he was going to uh, uh, commit the attack because Pius, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Services, was sponsoring and supporting refugees that were arriving in the United States. And he was angry about the so-called migrant caravan that was coming to the US-Mexico border, and therefore he attacked a synagogue. And it's the same in Charlottesville. In Charlottesville, where there was a debate over Confederate symbols in the United States, what happened? A debate about racism in the States turned into a place where chants of Jews will not replace us and swastika flags were displayed. And so when you see um, uh, anxieties around other developments in the world today, whether it's migration across borders or whether it's, it's um, navigating issues of diversity, we often see that even though uh, individuals have uh, uh, grievances that um, involve targeting other minorities, often they will link it back somehow to Jews and to conspiracy theories. Um, we believe more must be done, and I know that, that uh, Elisa and James are gonna delve into this a little bit. We believe that more needs to be done to urge, encourage, and if necessary, um, uh, jostle uh, uh, social media platforms and internet service providers to do a better job of upholding their own terms and conditions. Uh, most of which ban uh, such content from being uh, promoted online. We make a significant distinction between distasteful content and content that systematically demonizes entire communities and in some cases seeks to glorify and incite violence against those communities. We are not here to police distasteful speech, and I think we all agree that because we value freedom of speech so much in this country, as we rightly do, freedom of expression, there needs to be space for opinions that we disagree with, including distasteful ones. But we must draw a clear line. 
when uh, we're talking about propagandists who are daily pumping out material, which is designed to win over adherents who are uh, uh, predisposed to commit heinous acts. I'm gonna close before I hand it over to Elisa with this quote, which I thought was, was very, very compelling. And, and there's an interesting study that I wanna preface this with. In 2014, the University of Chicago conducted a study looking at conspiracy theories in, in the United States. And it found that at least half of Americans believe in at least one conspiracy theory. Now, if someone believes that the moon landing is a hoax, I think we can agree that this is a generally benign conspiracy theory. If someone believes that Jews and Israel committed 9-11, I think we can agree that this could cause someone who's unstable to do something horrible. Lenny Posner is a member of the Jewish community from Connecticut, and his son was murdered at Sandy Hook. And after his son was murdered, he found himself confronting uh, trolls online who were accusing him of being an actor and accusing the entire attack of being a false flag that was staged by the US government. He is dedicated the year since his son's murder to exposing the fact that his son was a real person who was murdered and to urging uh, uh, social media providers and, and governments where necessary to take action to prevent these sorts of lies and the hostility that was directed against him and he's been forced to move homes multiple times. Uh, uh, and his words on, in this regard I think are really important. And I'll, after I say this I'll, I'll turn it over to Elisa. Lenny Posner says, I'm a proponent of free speech. I also have a legal right to be free from harassment free from defamation, free from attack, and someone's right to free speech doesn't take priority over my rights. The challenge with supporting conspiracy theorists and hoaxers existing out in the open is that being online legitimizes their position. It enables them to reach out to and engage with innocent, easily led or mentally ill people who can be indoctrinated and manipulated with much greater ease. That is exactly what has happened. In most cases, it isn't the original hoaxer who is issuing the death threats, videotaping children, or doxing, that is publishing private information about my family. It's the followers. And I think that's what we need to, to address here. Uh, the people who are pumping out anti-Semitic uh, propaganda, or propaganda targeting Muslims, the LGBT community, other communities, uh, they are throwing fuel on the fire that others may pick up and use to harm other people. And therefore, we need to go after the source, and we need to ensure that more meets, needs, uh, more is done to uh, to uh, to take on this issue. Um, Elise is going to talk about what's been going on in other countries, and I think this is particularly important because uh, this week the House of Commons Justice Committee has announced or, or has begun a study looking at the phenomenon of online hate. It's something that CJA has has worked very hard to advance. We've mobilized thousands of Canadians to email the Justice Minister supporting this initiative. And we have a, a uh, strategy that we believe the government should, uh, or, or a four-point plan that we think the government should incorporate into the strategy to allow Canada to have a clear definition of online hate, to have clear systems and resources to track hate, to, to have tools in place to prevent hate through education aimed at young people to be more critically minded online, and where necessary to give law enforcement the tools to intervene to stop hate uh, propagandists online. Um, but that really requires looking at what's going on elsewhere. So with that in mind, maybe Elisa can, can take it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna give, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I'm gonna be talking about some international approaches, uh, specifically what's happening in the EU and Germany in terms of how they're addressing online hate. I'm gonna be talking also about something called censorship creep, which I'll define, no previous knowledge required. And I'm gonna talk also about some of the lessons when we can how we can apply it to a national strategy. Okay. Um, so to begin with, what's happening in the European Union is that in 2016, they devised a code of conduct countering legal hate speech online. Uh, it was a code of conduct between the European Commissioner and, or the European Commission, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And in 2018, other groups signed on voluntarily. That included Google+, Instagram, Snapchat, and Dailymotion. Um, essentially, it requires uh, companies to assess user reports within 24 hours, and then in following with EU and national legislation, take down illegal content. Uh, okay. uh, they've done four assessments of how it's gone starting in 2016, but most recently in February 2019, they noted that 89% of flagged content was assessed within 24 hours. 
uh, which is compared with a 40% increase in 2016. And then there's been a 72% takedown of illegal content, uh, which is compared to 28% in 2016. So it proved to be increasingly relevant and increasingly effective, but they are finding that companies still need to improve feedback to users about why content was taken down, as well as uh, increase in transparency in their approach. Uh, Germany has taken a much more aggressive approach with its 2018 Network Enforcement Act, which has been in effect since January of last year. Um, it requires a uh, takedown of material within 24 hours or within seven days for more complicated cases. Um, and failure to do so can result in a fine of up to 50 million euros, which is the steepest fine anywhere in the world for anything similar. Um, the thing that, there are two things of note of NetsDG, which is the shortened version of Network Enforcement Act. The first is that it applies to companies with two million or more users um, in Germany specifically. Uh, this is, it's important, there are a lot of legislative requirements of NetCG, but it's also lacking attention to companies that are smaller, so when companies or people are posting something offensive on bigger companies' platforms, they end up going to smaller companies, which is what we saw in Pittsburgh with the postings on Gab. Um, the other thing is that Germany's approach is in line with its very a uh, severe approach or arguably severe approach to addressing hate speech in general, which comes from their history. Um, in fact, there is um, the potential for incarceration for Holocaust denial and incitement against uh, minorities. So this is very much in line with their approach and not necessarily in line with others. Um, Uh, so it has gotten both praise and criticism. The praise is that within the first seven months of its implementation, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube had blocked tens of thousands of posts within 24 hours, which is pretty significant. Uh, the criticism, as many could guess, is that they are concerned about uh, violations of free speech rights and overreach. Companies that are afraid of being maligned or fined this, this very large fine might take things that are not really hate speech and take them down. Um, and the violations of free speech can extend internationally, which leads into uh, censorship creep, I think. Okay, well, I'll just talk to you about it. Um, creep, in this case, is defined as a tool designed for one purpose and ends up being used for another, uh, which can actually be quite good. It can lead to innovation, but in this case, for censorship creep, uh, it's something that was meant to affect national strategy and ends up implementing or being implemented globally. So a good example of this is the companies that signed on to uh, the code of conduct in the EU eventually announced plans that they were gonna develop a shared database of banned content to review and remove elsewhere. And it affected the terms of service internationally. So something that was meant to stay as an example within Germany's borders ended up being spread elsewhere. To the United States, it has a lot freer speech laws. Um, so why is this a problem? For those reasons, <laughs> but also because definitionally speaking, different countries define hate speech differently. So um, there have been cases in countries where they define hate speech to include fake news, and sometimes fake news is very problematic, but other times it's news that people don't agree with and they call it fake news, and so it could, like, it could lead to issues of access to information in general. So something to be concerned about for those reasons. Um, also, if you take down information, it doesn't necessarily mean it disappears. It can simply go to a different site. Um, and the presence has been argued that if people get to talk about these hateful speech uh, issues, they might actually alleviate some of the hate. Um, but if it's taken offline, people might not be able to do that. Uh, and finally, it can hamper law enforcement work. Uh, law enforcement might use online to to track different people and to figure out what's happening, and if it's not available, then it's harder to do. I'm gonna try one more time. I'm not sure if it's gonna work, but we'll see. Okay, bird. No. Okay. Um, so the lessons that we can be learned. Oh, yeah, oh good. Okay, lessons. <laughs> um, we have uh, a cyst in the back. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, basically, we should be instituting clear definitions of hate speech. Um, uh, our organization uses the International Holocaust um, Alliance's definition, which uh, which has been taken up by different places within government and has been gained ground. Um, and other communities are, are welcome to use such a flexible approach as well. 
Um, we're also looking at a multi-pronged approach on and offline. So there should be digital literacy offline as well, just so folks who encounter material, if it's not taken down, know how to interact with it, as well as social engagement, because whether it's online or offline, um, folks need to know each other and so that the hate speech doesn't actually settle and become factual. Uh, and finally, any Made in Canada approach, which is something that we're advocating for, must work with existing international approaches to walk the line between protecting society and safeguarding free speech. And I know that James is gonna talk a lot more about the interesting technical side of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, should I just go for it? Sure. Uh, so, first I'm just gonna talk about this chart. This was uh, people using the term white genocide online all around the world, um, particularly on social media platforms, but also in comment sections of websites and also inside news articles themselves. Um, and then over the 24 hour period after the March 14th attack in Christchurch, that increased by 1100%. So for anyone who's not aware, the cultural theory of white genocide is that immigrants are coming to Western countries to breed and replace people of white skin. It's the most disgusting ideology, most genocidal ideology I've ever heard of. Uh, the, the idea that this is what people are moving to North America or Europe to actually do. Uh, they're economic migrants. There's no conspiracy theory ran by governments to do this. This is what people believe. And in 2015 and 2016, in the run-up to the US election, um, myself and working with Cision, we ran an experiment. If we monitored the entire internet and every single person talking about every single political candidate in every single state or province, because we did this in Canada as well, could we predict elections? And more so what we found was with a little bit of polling data to help guide what we were actually searching for, you could 92% of the time identify when a specific candidate was gonna win a primary in the United States. I got everything right except for Nevada. I don't know how to predict anything in Nevada. Maybe it's because there's Reno in Nevada and Las Vegas, I don't know. But I can't predict anything in Nevada. The rest of the country I could though. And most terrifyingly enough, we accurately predicted that Hillary Clinton was gonna lose. And I could pinpoint what instance created that. Obviously the Comey letter created a lot more conversation about Clinton's emails um, opposed to uh, the Access Hollywood tape as an example. So we tracked 120 different topics in every single state, for every single race, across the whole country. Uh, we weren't just looking at social media like Twitter and Facebook, we were also looking at news articles and comments. So we tracked more than 3 billion mentions online, 1.6 billion tweets, about a billion news articles globally, and how they were shared online. And when we were seeing that, when we were engaging with that content, what we found was at any given time, between 30 and 40% of people talking about Hillary Clinton's emails or talking about Donald Trump were actually bots. They weren't real people. They were machines, they were tweeting nonsense. And more and more of the nonsense that I saw, because I'm engaging with this content, I have to write the searches, I have to like build out the code sets that are searching the internet to find this content. More and more what I saw was hate speech. Hate speech, hate speech, hate speech over and over and over again. It was disgusting. And what I saw mostly was the term white genocide being promoted and shared in alignment with hashtag make America great again, MAGA. So when I introduced this concept to the CBC in 2016, they were asking us if we had elections data. Uh, they knew about the experiment. We had already talked to them. Decisions a media partner. We work with every media organization in the country. I had to introduce the concept of what white genocide was to them in a meeting with a team of producers. Um, they, once they got a little bit aware, all like, oh yes, this makes sense. It's right in alignment with, with Nazism, it's right in alignment with the KKK and these sorts of organizations. When the Christchurch attack happened and they read the manifesto, they knew exactly what they were talking about by that point. So we know where we've come. We've come from a scenario where these theories, these cultural conspiracy theories, we're lurking in the background of our psyches and uh, uh, of a culture. And now they're in the forefront. And the attack in Christchurch, it was actually a communication medium. Violence is a communication medium. And it's a very effective one. The same way a journalist will end up writing news stories about tweets they see. 
people will now write tweets, they, hit tweets that will then create news articles about violence that they engage with. It's the very same modality that makes a protest effective. You get thousands of people together. It's disruptive and it creates uh, awareness of an issue. In this case, the goal was to make awareness of the cultural idea of white genocide. And as a society and as communicators and as media professionals and as politicians, and as journalists and as teachers, we need to fight against that in every single way we possibly can. It is not just, in you know, my opinion, it, it, the social network's position to do so, but our politicians and our educators and our families and our neighbors. It, it's, it's the discussion with every single person that you, that you know about the value of immigrants in a society. Um, so if we could just, uh, I'm not sure if this will work, but let's give this a shot. I got the point it. Exactly. Oh, that way. <laughs> Boom. You're the IT guy. <laughs> oh, yes. I know all technology because I know one technology. Um, this uh, slide's a little bit difficult to see, but what we are looking at here, this is intolerant language use. So we have, you know, on any given month, so this is September 2017, about 200,000 people will use very obvious hate speech in comments, and that's including terms like white genocide or you can imagine the words that people use to describe other nationalities. Is this Canada? This is not international. Okay. So it, at times it ebbs and flows. And in 2017, it was quite high right after the US election. Uh, data that we shared with the CBC showed that hate speech online and, and discussions of racism in Canada increased by 600% after the US election. Uh, there was some great write-ups in McLean's and, and on the conversation and the CBC itself. But as this trends down, and it did trend down for quite a long time. What this orange bar here is, is people talking about QAnon. This is a very pernicious, it's like a meta conspiracy theory. It's every conspiracy theory lumped into one. Whether it's cultural, whether it's the moon landing, whether it's anti-vaccination, every single little idiom of disgust that society's collected is sitting inside discussions of QAnon. And while discussions of hate speech may be going down, actual usage of hate speech is going down, the amount of people that are talking about conspiracy theories like QAnon has accelerated and continues to accelerate and has continued to be popularized. It's not just that there's news stories about it. It's, it's just, just everywhere. Is QAnon, is that an acronym for something? Uh, the Q Anonymous, oh, uh, so the, the idea of QAnon was that there is a social media poster who is, is named Q, and he writes these sort of esoteric diatribes uh, on Twitter and on Facebook and, and on Reddit. And what happens is people interpret them and say, well, this is when the Great Awakening is going to occur, and Donald Trump will become king of the world. Literal nonsense that these guys say. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a shortening, but it's actually the, the Q conspiracy is the, uh, the linkage there. So, one thing to consider about this, and one of the reasons why we're seeing these sort of accelerations of hate speech and accelerations of uh, conspiracy theories, is we've now reached a point where the publishing capacity of every single person in this room, every single person can publish their crazy ideas. It used to be a couple hundred years ago, you know, fewer than 1% of people could write something down. I'm writing like I'm typing, but it would be described, and it would hit a printing press, or it would be published in a journal. And you accelerate that up into 1990, maybe two or three percent of people. You have politicians, large advertisers that have enough money to be able to promote themselves inside the media. But now, you know, coming into 2018, 80, 85 percent, 90 percent of people have social media. Anyone can take their crazy idea and put it in front of other people. And this is the acceleration point of why we're seeing hate spread so quickly and so powerfully among different audiences. One thing we also found during the US election was what you say and do online, you're very likely going to actually take action on what you say and you're gonna do. If you say you're gonna vote for someone three times, I could mark you as a likely voter. If you attend a rally, which millions of people did in the 2016 election, yeah, you're probably gonna vote for Donald Trump if you go to his rally. What you do and say online is a predicted action of what you're going to do and say in your life. Um, you know, and one way to think about that, and Gartner had a very good study on this, 54% of consumers are values-based. 
So how that relates back to white nationalism is particularly around the influence of what an advertiser has on social networks. So put it grand if you remember the Momo meme on YouTube. So for anyone that doesn't, yeah, there's a few of you that have heard of it. So Momo was a, uh, it's a, just a terrifying little video that if, if children engaged, it's sort of like uh, um, a horror story or just a, just a, just a, a, a kid's story. What, what Momo was, was if, uh, if someone engaged in certain actions online, it could lead to a kid committing suicide. And a terrifying video went viral across the internet. It's a hoax. It's just, it's just, a, it's just like a horror film. It's not real, but it was popularized. This got spread so far and so fast that advertisers started asking YouTube, and this is just last month, advertisers asked YouTube, they didn't want their ads to be placed on channels about families anymore because there was so much danger in conversations about suicide, but also conversations that always happen on uh, videos with kids. Uh, there's a lot of pedophilia on the internet. A lot of people will comment very aggressively just about children and about families the deviant sexual manners. Advertisers didn't want to be associated to that. And in one month after the Momo hoax, YouTube demonetized family channels on, uh, on YouTube. So what that means is you can't make ad revenue yeah. as a YouTube creator off of this type of content anymore. They did that in one month. It's been three years that people have been talking about hashtag white genocide on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook. And what really has happened? There's been some changes on Facebook. Twitter's created an abuse policy. There's some really great actions that are taking from a federal level. But until we start affecting the values of consumers, until we start actually in engaging in ways that make advertisers aware that this is content that we will not accept as a consumer, I do not want it to be anywhere near my children, then there will be no action to take. And where you see the split actually occurring is you have more and more content being created online. It's not that there's any less content being created today, but what we now have is a complete loss of control over what content is being shared and put in front of people. Those between the ages of 18 and 34, this is from a study from the CRTC called the CMR, the Canadian Media Report, or Consumer Media Report from 2017. One quarter of people between the ages of 18 and 34 no longer watch television. They're getting their news elsewhere. They're getting their news on the internet. This is gonna get worse. Every single year it's gonna be five to 6% of people who are cutting the cord and, uh, from their cable subscription and more and more people just aren't getting it in the first place. Um, so just to wrap it up, we are in a scenario now where ideas travel very, very quickly. Those ideas can carry as much hatred and as much call to action for people to incite hatred as you can fit inside a tweet or in a video. And violence is the medium of that message, whether it's personal one-to-one -one abuse on Twitter or on Facebook or anywhere else, or if it's an actual action of violence meant to promote hatred in, in a community, whether it's in Pittsburgh or Christchurch. Uh, so we're, we're in a very precarious time where these ideas are at the greatest level of awareness ever the countervailing force of pushing against them is, 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 is the true challenge of our day as communicators and as community members. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Okay. And so, uh, so um, maybe yeah, I, I think we're gonna start with a Q and A, because um, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. People have probably have very, um, a lot of different questions. Uh, we'll turn on the lights, Marie. So I'm gonna ask you, anyone who has a question, please lift your hand. Um, mention who you are, if you're affiliated with an organization or in Super University, please say so. And I ask you to refrain from going on a 20 minute dialogue. It's a question and answer period, not social commentary. Okay, so who would like to go first? Please, sir. Hi, my name's Shelton, I'm just an interested person. The, the study you did, you did that retroactively, where you, you looked at all the data from all the states, provinces, that we, we did it live. Oh, you did it live. So my, my question is, people like Bannon, Smart, smart people, there's a lot of really smart people out there. Is the uh, data, is the technology in the context of climate where you can reverse it? In other words, you can plan that. Did he, did he plan that he was just guessing? Or was he one step ahead of what you uncovered and that was planned? And can you 
think they can do that? What we saw, and it wasn't just me looking at the data, there were other researchers that were doing very similar efforts uh, who are identifying how bots were influencing the election. Uh, Professor Philip Howard at Oxford University who was leading the charge. I picked up off of his research and we talked about how we might predict and identify what was going on. There were malevolent actors creating content with the goal of reaching virality. Marketers do it every single day. They do it with advertising and they do it with creative content. Um, I can't speak on behalf of what uh, Steve Bannon would, had done, or, uh, but I could point you toward ideas like what Cambridge Analytica was doing, mm -hmm. which was using advertising to polarize people and dis disincentivize them from voting. Uh, that was, those were actions that were taking place. There were bots that were publishing content to disincentivize people from taking action electorally. Um, we were watching what was happening, and it was a train wreck. A slow motion train wreck, you could watch it live every single day, and how it was changing conversations, how it's opening the type of language people were willing to use. If you see people use very hateful language online continuously, and wow, those posts are getting a lot of retweets, because gosh, a botnet is very good at mm -hmm. promoting a piece of content. It incentivized people to begin using that language. Yeah. Uh, the same way as all social memes work, uh, whether it's people just saying LOLZ instead of LOL, or if people are talking about um, you know, the Kardashians, it doesn't really matter what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's always a flavor that people adopt in the, in the language online. Would you consider, if you um, publishing, your, like in the future, like on a daily basis, publish that so people can see it and have that uh, We did as broadly as we could. So we shared the data day-to-day uh, -day with Reuters. We were sharing it with the CBC. We were live on the National for several nights in a row, and they continued to share it as we could. I was writing blog posts every day about it. Um, you know, it was a weird Canadian guy, journalist, sharing graphs about billions of tweets, and it was hard for journalists to conceptualize mm -hmm. until it got much closer to the election. Who else would like to ask a question? Hi, I'm uh, affiliated with, with MIGS. Um, you might not be able to answer this, uh, but I just wondered, ahead of the election that's happening in Canada, uh, are you noticing anything new in terms of hate speech or what people are seizing on, just so us as like an informed public might be aware of um, what some of the, the sort of threats or, or new trends might be? What you see is a great deal of anti-immigrant bias. Um, the commentary is less pernicious. Uh, not that it's not there, it's just that the reporting mechanisms on the social media platforms have improved. Um, at the same time, it depends on which fever swamp you want to enter into. Uh, if you go on to 4chan or 8chan, you're gonna see just as vile things as you saw in 2016. Um, there's good reporting mechanisms on, on social media platforms now that people are using. Uh, all the social media platforms are closing down their networks in, in some some manners that are making it a little bit harder to reach virality with that hate, hate content, but I'd like to turn it over to you guys. Uh, what, have, what have your community seen and what have you been engaging with? Uh, sure, I, yeah, I mean, I think, um, so it's interesting because, again, going back to the experience of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is unique in that it's used as a political tool. Um, people uh, historically have usually um, incited <coughs> others to hate Jews to, for some gain for political gain, for economic gain, or whatnot. And so I, th I don't think it's that different when it comes to anti-immigrant rhetoric online. Um, it certainly is a political tool. Um, you, you do certainly see uh, people devolving to the lowest common denominator online in political discussions. Whether it's, uh, you know, and, and the worst examples I've seen are calls for, for murder of particular Canadian politicians. Um, and the, the failure, I think, of authorities to deal with some of these incidents um, is a concern. And by authorities, I mean both social media platforms, but also in some cases, um, uh, you know, legal authorities to intervene when it comes to calls for violence. Um, so uh, I know there was a lot of attention around uh, uh, Michael Wernick's comments about, mm -hmm. about rhetoric in the context of, uh, of the, the election year that's on upon us. Um, I think we do have to take this very seriously. Uh, I can't speak to it at a, at a data level, but the trends I've seen is that wherever you have an echo chamber forming of like-minded people who rev each other up, and there's a ton of psychology research to show that 
um, people in self-selecting groups, ideological groups, uh, become increasingly polarized. And they often develop to the most extreme voices within those forums. Um, and so just as, as James was saying, people are following the lead of bots, to some extent, I think people do follow the lead of the, of the most obnoxious voice within their social forum. And the work, most egregious example is, is calls for violence against politicians. Um, Elisa, do you have any other? I, I don't have anything to add, no. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it would, yeah if, it, it would, if it was a trend in comparison to what you saw in 2016 in the US, that it's not just any specific <coughs> cultural or religious group, it's anti-immigrant sentiment, calls for violence against immigrants, right. um, but you're seeing rise in Canada or be maintained in conversations since 2016. So it's not necessarily new, but it's gaining increased attention, certainly with border crossings in Quebec. Uh, you could see even the political parties, which are more right-leaning, have to take actions against their worst offenders in their own parties. Uh, if you go onto Maxime Bernier's Twitter feed and see what people are replying, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. it's very hard to not to identify what dog whistles different individuals are going after. And does that make you have predictions then, uh, like vis-a-vis -vis his uh, political chances, or? I'm not capable of conducting the same monitoring regime. Okay. Um, social media platforms are much more careful about how they enable uh, broad scale population level monitoring. It's not that I'm not able to do it, it's that there's that there are ethical concerns to uh, imply. Um, so I, I don't have a, a data backing to say whether Maxine is gonna have any seats in the House of Commons. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, I believe, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, um, I get to, to, to add on. First of all, I'm a project manager in IT. <laughs> so I, I look at the, a lot of it on the data. And I'll get back to, we had Michael Petru here what, about a month ago. Um, how can we, and I'm addressing the question to all of you, but mostly to you, how can we educate people in understanding echo chambers uh, filter bubbles, uh, the right construction of an algorithm, whether, you know, and how it's influenced, uh, because that will also, especially at a younger age, deter the people and understand that there's a responsibility into what is posted there, and it could be crap, or it could be, you know, accurate, and therefore, and the impact on the psyche also. So, am I, am I being too ideal? ideological and thinking that we can change it this way or? <laughs> I would start with media studies in high school yeah. or media studies in elementary school. Good point. In grade 10 in, in Ontario, I was fortunate enough to take a media studies class that identified uh, a, a great deal about how advertising worked. I yeah. found it to be very persuasive, which is yeah. one of the reasons why I entered into a career in media, because yeah. I was aware of how it functioned. Um, I think just the same way sex ed needs to be discussed early and yeah. often, I think media studies should be discussed early and often, and that curriculum will obviously need to be updated for the day of, uh, of social media, not just the idea that someone might be sexting with their uh, with their classmate, uh, but with the idea that there are corners of the internet that are not worth going into, Correct. and that there are ideas that are not valid and you need to have authoritative sourcing to actually understand what's real and what's not. Um, but the same goes for re-education of uh, older generations as well. Yeah, yeah I um, agree. Um, you know, thirteen percent of Canadians buy a print subscription of a newspaper. Forty-seven percent of Canadians pay for digital news online. Eighty-six percent of Canadians have social media. Yep. More than seventy percent of people over the age of sixty-five have social media, and they are the most common group yep. to share fake news. Yeah. So, yep. if you're trying to control hatred, and you're trying to control polarization, and you're trying to look at an electoral group and say, where can we make change? It's a, it's, a, it's a national priority to educate people about what is a validated source and what is obviously non-critical fake news that yeah. you're seeing online and if you're, you know, across generational spectrums. And it does speak to digital literacy in general, so important, yeah. as you said. But in terms of figuring out how to address the bubble that people find themselves in, it's also in life. It's not just online. Oh, so, I agree. Yeah, diversifying your access to people, figuring out how to uh, have social engagement that extends beyond your group is really important. And there are algorithms within Facebook that kind of, they want you to stay on for as long as possible, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so they yeah. want you to, to feel safe or to feel engaged in a space, so mm -hmm. you just keep spending more and yeah. more hours yeah. and are exposed to more yeah. and more. 
advertisement. So understanding that is important, but understanding that it's also the friends you choose and what that reflects in your own life is also important. So online and offline education is really important, not just about digital life, but expanding expanding our understanding of others is also really important. So yeah. for you. And that being said, and I'll conclude with that to leave it with Faith, do we see uh, an opening by our governments? And I'll, you know, I'll exclude <coughs> the goal here. Just, are any of you from Quebec? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, are you on? Okay, but it, and Ontario does court. Is there any, you know, um, mindfulness from the government to say we need to address this now, not in five years? Why? Because you can't catch up with technology, number one. Uh, or is are we barking off the wrong tree here? So it, it is one of the elements of our, our pitch mm -hmm. to the federal government. Um, because the internet <laughs> is federally regulated, but obviously education is provincially yeah. uh, administered. Um, we are calling for uh, the federal government to lead uh, a national strategy to deal with online hate, which has to include an education portion mm -hmm. uh, in partnership with the provinces or exclusively delivered by the provinces. Yeah. I think you, you hit the nail on the head and, and my colleagues echoed it that um, we, you know, there are two sides to this. One is the supply side and one is the demand side. And on the demand side, we need uh, a much more literate public. Uh, you know, my, my three children are growing up in a world where this is only gonna be more prevalent. Yeah. Um, and if anything, you know, history shows that where you have significant technological changes in any field, there's a period of adaptation uh, on the part of society, and that period usually is accompanied by uh, a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. Mm -hmm. um, not to diminish the, the scale of the, the impact, but it takes time for people to adapt to the technology that people have created. And therefore, I, I do think that it is important for this to be delivered by the schools. Obviously, uh, parents are the most important element, but the reality is if you look at some people who have been radicalized, you look at someone like Dylan Roof, Mm -hmm. who was in, in, you know, deeply infested in white uh, supremacy, mm -hmm. uh, who murdered people at a Charleston church, mm -hmm. African Americans. You look at Aaron Driver, uh, a convert to Islam from just outside London, Ontario, who was on his way to commit a suicide bombing in downtown Toronto before the police caught him. Right. In both of those cases, these are people who come from very broken homes. Very yeah, broken homes, no, they I had agree. clear mental health issues, yeah. in some cases clear drug addiction issues. Um, and so, ideally, the, the home is where it starts, but because so many homes are not going to be equipped to deliver that sort of knowledge, I think what James is saying is bang on. We need we need this to be seen as, and I, I love the analogy with sex ed, this yeah. should be a compulsory element of learning Absolutely. how to engage with the world. Because you're quite right, we can have all the regulations we want, we can have uh, great uh, responsiveness on the part of Facebook and Twitter, at the end of the day there will always be corners of the internet that will be accessible, and we cannot outsmart our children from accessing them. Therefore, we need them to be educated to know that there are, as you said, some rabbit's holes that are not worth going down. Okay, thank you. Emily, you, you had a question? Yeah. My name is Lucy Shapiro. Uh, I'm wearing a couple of hats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you talked about the demographic of young and old, and it's, it's across the board. Mm -hmm. So yeah, educating the young <coughs> is absolutely vital. To genocide education, and we, we work with governments to try and um, impact youth and educate. But the problem lies within the home as well. So, how do you take this information? And yes, we can work with education ministry, but how can you translate that across the board? And what are you doing to impact the public at large? That's a good question. So I've got an idea of, of how to do that. I don't think anyone, um, if we were, if, if as a society or as a set of governments and as a set of organizations, we were all doing our best to prevent this sort of speech from proliferating, we wouldn't be seeing an increase in it. So I, I don't think we have a perfect answer for that. But I do have an idea. Some of the activities that you're doing that. So I like what talk about. Mothers Against Drunk Driving does. Mothers Against Drunk Driving uses the victims of crime to attack uh, the actions and behaviors and thought processes of people. They also use the power of shame. Shame is an immense motivator and demotivator for action. Uh, right now, there is a problem with anonymous accounts, particularly anonymous accounts on social media, 
uh, where people have no leverage to be shamed. They're in action to be shameless. And because there's no tie back to the actions that um, occur, if I publish a screed online about immigrants and I happen to work in the public sphere and I'm off behind an anonymous account, there's no leverage of shame against me. Uh, so I think discussions like this are a really good starting point. Uh, what Cision does is uh, we enable rights organizations to use our newswire services to promote their ideas. Um, I, I can't really speak much more beyond that. Uh, but I would, in terms of actions in the future and how to educate, I would look at Mothers Against Drunk Driving as a very interesting model. We have a question in the back. Yeah, um, Matthew Kowalski from the uh, Holocaust uh, Museum. Um, I have a two-fold question. Um, I'd like to hear um, from Matthew about the letter that was published, uh, I think today or yesterday, in Toronto Star about um, the call for legislation in Canada. Um, we know that um, there's an openness uh, that the Minister Bedell um, said that study uh, this uh, if and the window is quite short because um, it would have to be done before June because um, there will be elections coming in, in, uh, in September or in the fall so is it reasonable to expect that such a law could be adopted uh, before June um, so this is the first question and the second is about what uh, Zuckerberg said on Facebook uh, on March 21st so he said that um, it was time for um, for uh, re uh, governments to act, and, but he was calling for a, a, an international consensus, um, saying that it was not up to uh, private companies to regulate themselves, uh, what could happen from that. Um, and since, um, well, I don't want to get into conspiracy myself, but uh, some hateful bots are um, who are disrupting elections um, in the West are located in countries uh, where governments benefit from it. Um, again, is it reasonable to, accept, to, to uh, expect that there could be uh, such a consensus um, from the international community to take action? Kyle, do you want to touch on this? Yeah, so, so if anyone has known, yesterday, uh, myself and my colleague Duncan, uh, we published an op-ed in the Toronto Star about why Canada should consider uh, legislating Facebook. Um, and, and this comes out of, we've done a lot of work with Global Affairs Canada looking at the use of artificial intelligence to deal with online hate. We found through our studies and workshops we've done that actually big tech, big tech companies are overselling artificial intelligence as a solution to online hate. They're scaling up in countries where they they're very often don't hire enough content moderators to understand the language, and it's spilled over where Facebook has been accused of helping prevent the genocide against Rohingya in Myanmar. So we wrote this piece after the Christchurch attack in which the video um, of the attack went online, was used by the Turkish president to, to create hatred and had a terrorist attack in, in uh, Utrecht the day after. We just analyzed this and we, we think that big tech has for too long said that we must be self-regulated and we're now seeing that on many areas the, the, the technology they developed are being misused. And, and we think governments should actually take a harder look at, at you know, it, it's, it's, one, it's one major industry that has billions of people on the platforms and they, they don't have to act like media companies, but they allow a lot of things to be broadcast that, that foments this online network hate. So we just made the argument that there should be, um, that they should be legislated. That it, it just, it seems a little crazy that, that this um, sector has been allowed to behave this way. And it goes far beyond just hate speech, but also um, into election so, so that, that's the op-ed that we wrote. I, I understand it's very complex. There are issues. You said that you know some of the authoritarian closed states want to regulate social media in order to control what the population sees. Our position was not that we should become like 1984, but that clearly there are certain services of the platforms, anonymous accounts that can be misused and, and that it has to be given some serious consideration. Uh, in terms of uh, the international approach, it's, it's hard to say what's possible and what's not. Um, the concerns were outlined as to um, censorship creep where one thing happens in one country and it happens anyway. So regardless of whether we want it to happen, it's happening to some extent. Um, in terms of um, news or bots being used, uh, Facebook is or has implemented a transparency approach to advertising. And so 
they're hoping that that will address some of the concerns that people have with the election. So um, in terms of legislation, it's always hard to know what point at which it will be developed or implemented, but there are activities that are happening in Facebook. I know trying to <coughs> implement more transparency. Uh, it remains to be seen what, what will happen, but there is that intention there. Just a quickie for Lisa. You mentioned earlier that Canada should work with other countries doing a good job on cutting back on hate and so forth. Can you give a list of three or four or five, six countries that are doing good, good work? <laughs> so um, I, I hesitate. The researcher in me is always like, oh, good. I don't know if I can actually make that qualifier. But um, they're certainly making attempts, and they've seen what works and what doesn't because they've come before us. So. The European Union covers a, a, a number of countries, so um, their code of conduct is something that I, I would recommend that we look at, um, especially because it, it goes back into looking at what works in the European Union, will it work here, and it's already starting to uh, affect us internationally. And then uh, Germany has a very uh, either wildly accepted or wildly opposed uh, approach. It's Again, it's worth looking at France is coming up with a structure as well. Um, I'm not sure what stage is that exactly. I don't know if you, if you know. Um, and, and England as well. So uh, all of these countries to work with and develop um, a more streamlined approach would be would be helpful and to learn from those who have come before us is always a good a good way to do it. Yes. Yes, um, my name's Karen. I just, I'm very surprised we haven't mentioned the word George Soros during this talk um, or, you know, just blatant insults on Jews online. I, I noticed they're often, I mean, Facebook is going, usage is going down from what I understand, um, as, or at least um, as, as a venue for sharing information. I think we have new technologies every day that come out, so I'm seeing a lot of hate speech on live comments and live feeds in mm -hmm. YouTube. I'm seeing it on um, in the videos themselves, so I'm wondering, uh, do media analysis companies and, and the Jewish community take the time to look at the insults that concern the Jewish community? And I think often that's um, that's you know wild speculation on how Jews are the richest people in the world and they control everything. And and you know white genocide is, is kind of weird because I think many Jews can. You know, would consider themselves white, but these hate groups don't. So, and they're often the the, the target of the, of the hate. So, um, I, I'm yeah, I'm just curious as to how you track uh, specific insults and, and conspiracy theories against Jews, and whether you take into account, you know, transcribing the millions of videos that come online every day, or and comments that are posted. So, yeah, why do they disappear? Yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> so, there are sections of the internet which you can't monitor. Yeah. Black holes, complete, <coughs> complete inaccessibility for monitoring platforms. Um, there are speech to text tools that we use to monitor radio and television that do a live transcription of what's said, just the same way you might see Amazon Alexa picking up off of your request to buy milk and have a toby chair. So there are systems that we have in place for monitoring some YouTube channels. There are 1.6 billion users on YouTube. Yeah. They're building out about, I don't know, 100 million hours a week or something mm -hmm. in terms of audio and video. Mm -hmm. uh, there is not enough computer capacity on the, like literally in our, certainly in any media monitoring company's tool set to be able to monitor all of that. Then there are systems like Discord which is a system that people use to play games with each other and actually talk to each other while they play those games, games that don't have those systems built in. That's been a commonality and a, a space where white nationalists have logged into games and actually organized events yeah. using Discord. Um, same thing on Twitch. So Twitch is a live gaming platform where people can interact with each other and actually like watch themselves play games. The content that's being said through Twitch can be abhorrent and there's no way to track it. Same with very common games like World of Warcraft or uh, uh, Counter-Strike Go. It's a first-person shooter game where terrorists shoot SWAT team members and vice versa. 
Again, we can't track anything that people are saying there, just like I can't track every single person that says something in the public square. And there's, that's where the privacy concern comes in. It might be physically possible to do something, but whether it's something that's ethical or whether it's actually something efficacious in terms of reducing hatred would be the determination. Uh, in terms of the terminology we use, we, I do monitor terms like globalist shill or Soros-backed protesters. I do track those specific types of terms. Uh, there are lots of other terms that I could rattle off but the, or show you a keyword string which we use. I call it the intolerant language search. Mm -hmm. It's very broad. Um, so these things are being monitored. Uh, in terms of what a media monitoring company can offer is um, we're restricted by what the social platforms and what media organizations enable us to sell. Uh, we're a business. We don't monitor this holistically. And it's not something that we can actually sell to governments particularly because it would count as government surveillance of the population, which social networks don't really want. Uh, but we can try to raise awareness of the issues as we find them and as we spot them, which is part of what we're doing here today. To your, to your question, uh, from the perspective of the Jewish community, I think, uh, and the Soros example is an important one because it speaks to a broader problem. A lot of the most egregious content online targeting our community is uh, conveyed in a way that makes it difficult to deplatform, hence the use of ellipses, you know, brackets to refer to Jews, um, or Soros as a catch-all for a Jewish conspiracy to manipulate political events using money. George Soros, everyone knows, being the, the uh, philanthropist who invests in a lot of, uh, or funds a lot of uh, um, kind of progressive causes, um, is often demonized um, in anti-Semitic terms and used as a, as a prop to uh, showcase Jew, the Jew as being behind it all. Um, one of the biggest concerns is that, A, it makes it difficult to spot and identify as anti-Semitic for, for the non-Jewish world, even if we see it for what it is. But also the purveyors themselves are sharing content not knowing that they're promoting anti-Semitism. I see this all the time. I see people promoting, uh, posting videos of the Rothschilds on YouTube, uh, or on Facebook, but from YouTube. Um, not realizing that what they're posting is not an objective or even thought-provoking uh, documentary, but it really is uh, a set of tropes that are thinly veiled as a documentary. Um, you see this in the context of, the, of uh, spikes in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One of the things we often see is uh, really horrific, vicious video content put out, which is uh, manufactured to look like Israelis. So we see, for example, footage of, uh, of prisoners being tortured to death, uh, and the video is actually from Syria. Um, and you can obviously tell, and anyone who knows anything about what an Israeli military uniform looks like can recognize that th these are, these are uh, security forces in, in Syria that are torturing uh, regime dissidents. And people will take these videos and share them online, uh, and they're described as Israeli soldiers torturing Palestinians. Um, and so we, we see this phenomenon of people sharing content that they don't even know is fake and that they don't even know is anti-Semitic, which makes it very, very dangerous. Anti-Semitism is a virus. It adapts itself to its host. It adapts itself to the political and religious and cultural values of its host. And what's particularly disturbing, as with other forms of hate, it's entirely possible to be an anti-Semite and not realize you're acting in an anti-Semitic fashion. And that's why online is so um, is such a, a concern for us because it is where our community most often, I would say, anecdotally encounters anti-Semitism. <coughs> uh, a study was recently done of, of Canadian Jews, a survey by uh, York University and the University of Toronto and Environics. It found that the, the segment of the Jewish community of Canada that's most likely to have encountered an anti-Semitic slur in the last 12 months are Jews between the ages of 18 and 29. Why? They're on campus and they're online. And so I think we realize that online is, you know, as Kyle mentioned, is, uh, is something of a wild west. And the approach that's needed, and I don't know if it's regulation, I don't know if it's government, government legislation, I don't even know if it's self-regulation, Whatever approach, the status quo is not working, and therefore we need this study uh, that Parliament is launching to lead somewhere <coughs> meaningful. I would add that um, while the internet's been around for a while and social platforms have been around for a while, the approach to trying to figure out how to regulate it is is somewhat new, and so we're trying to figure it out in, in good company. There are many people trying to figure it out at this point, so whether we can find it in the, the, the dark corners, I think is what you said, 
um, or not, uh, we are looking at trends and we're trying to address it in the best way possible, but it's a, it's a building field and it's a building understanding and that's where we're, that's where we're approaching it from. I know my colleague Marie had a question, so we'll go to her and then we'll go. Um, two quick questions, just ask. Uh, there was an article yesterday in some UC newspaper that um, three uh, one shooter video games were created based on the uh, cartoon part, basically using the same video set um, for Team Online. Uh, what do you think the response would be against that? You know, if there's some game where people just create those same videos, why do you just first create it online? Well, so, Steam is the largest gaming platform in the world where independent creators can upload videos and where they can be downloaded. Uh, it would deplatform a game like that very quickly once it was uploaded if it got voted to be promoted by the platform itself. Um, removing it from the internet would likely be impossible given torrent sites and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, the dark web. I think the response from the gaming community uh, should be abhorrence. And I think that's what they did. Yeah. Do you think there should be like you know laws or some, some kind of punishment against those folks who created them because if you can find them mm -hmm. yeah. yes mm -hmm. yeah that that's promotion of violence that's hate speech mm -hmm. that's inciting violence uh, depicting it in that manner this is all these are crimes they need to be prosecuted uh, if you can find the person who yeah. did them yeah. right sure um a lot of the emphasis and solution oriented is towards like the general people in general and people at the fringes of society broken homes there. And now I'm wondering, if you look at the Labour Party in England, right? And just just broken apart over anti-Semitism. These, these are all Oxbridge graduates with you know from from wealthy backgrounds. And it's been said that, that anti-Semitism, right or wrong, has become pervasive. I mean, do you think these people are influenced? I mean they're very well educated access to everything. I don't, but how do you see that? Any, any comments on that? Because that's the other end, the extreme end of society, and yet this is happening. Uh, I don't know how to phrase <laughs> the question. Um, if I'm following, to cite a fellow of Mix, actually, Phil Gursky, there's actually, for certain ratifies people, there are no trends that we can track, which is a, a really big problem for trying to address the issue. Uh, more so when white nationalists are, are a problem, there's, there's more of a trend there. But in terms of uh, different forms of radicalization and different forms of hate, there's there's no stated or identified commonality at this point, and so it's it's hard. <laughs> it's yeah, a challenge it's hard, to, yeah. to identify. Yeah. Is there a link between Jeremy Corbyn type of anti-Semitism and what goes on online? There is in the UK for sure. They they have found so in the UK right now, according to the latest survey of Amer of UK Jews. Uh, Almost 9 in 10 UK Jews believe that Jeremy Corbyn is anti-Semitic. Almost 9 in 10. This is a community that historically voted Labour. More than 4 in 10 say that if he is elected Prime Minister, they will seriously consider leaving the UK. More than 4 in 10. So, so much of this phenomenon has played itself out online. And if you look at Jewish Labour MPs, or people who have left Labour, MPs who have left for the independent group in Parliament, they, they are frequently targeted by bullying online. Um, with, uh, and by the way, the same, the same happens on a much smaller scale with um, students in general in, in Canada on campus. Yes. Uh, Jewish students, but also other students. People are horrible online, and they bully each other online. And we, we certainly do see that in the UK with, with Corbyn. I think your point, sir, is an important one, which is that it's, this, this problem is not a left, right-left phenomenon Problem. It is. It is a human phenomenon. Um, people uh, can, uh, especially when they're in groups, can act horribly to one another. Jews are often a convenient target, but as are other minorities. And when you have the benefit of anonymity with anonymous accounts, yeah. with group validation, with self-selection and and uh, uh, echo chambers, uh, the dynamic only gets worse. And so we certainly do see it in the form of white supremacy. And that in particular, I think there's a clear link between those actions and violence. What's happening in the UK within the Labour Party, I don't think anyone believes that there's a clear link between Jeremy Corbyn's rhetoric and um, acts of violence that have taken place toward Labour Jewish members. I, that's not the concern that most UK Jews have. The concern they have 
is that this will lead to social exclusion, isolation, demonization, and maligning of Jews in Europe. So they will leave not because they're fearful of being attacked, they'll leave because they're fearful that their kids will never be treated as equals as Jews within the UK. It is a different phenomenon, um, but anti-Semitism is multifaceted. It's about security threats, but it's also about social exclusion, denial of equal rights, et cetera, within society. And that's what I think is really the core of what's happening with Corbyn. Similarly, it, stupidity knows no bounds. Right. Ignorance right. knows no bounds. Right. There's no generational or wealth uh, vector that determines whether someone will believe the most insane things that are said. Uh, you see this in the United States and in Canada about, regarding the anti-vaccination movement. Yeah. Right. It's literally affluent white suburbanites who think that vaccines are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the measles will indiscriminately kill infants Correct. and indiscriminately pre uh, uh, enable uh, birth defects when you're talking about rubella. Uh, you know, not necessarily the most pernicious or dangerous disease unless you have a, a pregnant woman. That's the reason why the rubella vaccine exists. Uh, it prevents uh, miscarriage and, and illness and death of the infant. So, uh, as, as, as Steve was describing, it's a tool. A Anti-Semitism and white nationalism is a tool to generate polarity amongst a voting population that has been tactically used by some politicians in the UK to drive the Leave campaign. Uh, and it was the groundwork was that it was years in the making. Uh, so it's, it, they might not actually hold the views that they espouse. They might actually think those views are important if you talk to them directly. Yeah, Hitler was a terrible guy. The Holocaust was horrible and evil. You never want to see that again. But by the way, we're really, really, really just trying to push on our middle-aged voters who are white in the suburbs of London to vote for the Leave campaign. I guess you're really addressing my question there. Are they thought leaders smart using this, or are they have they been influenced by the things? No, they're very. They know exactly what they they're know doing. What they're doing. This is yeah. it's, it's not an accident. Yeah, no, no. it's not it's, an accident. It's, it's uh, strategic. It's a communications campaign. Yeah. Same as Coca-Cola or Pepsi. We have time for about one or two more questions. Anyone would like to, or comment, or breathtaking insight? <laughs> no one? Um, are we okay if that ends there? So I want to, before we say thank our guests and give them the plot, I just want to thank you for coming. Um, if you're not signed up for a newsletter, please sign up. We have regular events on human rights and global affairs. Uh, this Friday, we're hosting a human rights and artificial intelligence forum that has a bunch of different experts talk about how AI is shaping human rights. Uh, I think we have a few seats left. And then on June 3rd, we're collaborating with Amnesty International and Erwin Kotler and the Raul Wallenberg Center to do Right City, a major human rights conference. We're, we're gonna have uh, Shafrak Chaparreze, uh, who was behind uh, the, the hijab movement in Iran, Erwin Kotler, Romeo Blair, a whole bunch of others. So please check, take, check that out, sign up. We'd love to see you there. And last but not least, I just wanna thank all of our three guests. Thank you so much, it was illuminating. And we remain committed to working with you to help deal with online anti-Semitism. So, Thank you so much for coming.